a 42 kilometer race trail race on the Volvic volcano. What the fuck is wrong with you, brother? <laughs> my my goal is I should always be able to run 10k in about 45 minutes. A lot of people will try and tell themselves this is not happening to me. Like that's the worst thing. It's happening. You've got to just let it come. Things are coming to you for a reason. So they're not limits. There are just situations that we haven't learned behaviors yet. In life, we have way too many choices and we're spoiled with choices. If you narrow things down and you put every ounce of energy into that thing you want to achieve, you can achieve it. This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive, but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com ladies and gentlemen it is my absolute honor to welcome to unstoppable today the inner fight marcus smith good to have you here marcus how are you bud Going. Thank you so much, mate. I'm, I've I'm, never I'm, fucked up the name Marcus before. I was like, Marcus. I was like, what the fuck is that? I was like, Jesus. <laughs> Marcus Smith. Jesus Christ. You can't get too many things wrong. How are you, mate? You good? Yeah, super awesome, mate. It's uh, it, it, it's actually it's morning here in Dubai and it's about 38 degrees. So, mate, I'm excited for midday. It'll be 50 and life's fucking brilliant, mate. So, yeah, 38 um, degrees in the morning. And by morning, he says it's like 5 a.m. So, <laughs> 5 a.m. and 38 degrees. Uh, and I'm going to assume zero humidity. It's like, what is it? One degree, one percent humidity or? I, it, actually, we get really savage humidity. That's what really makes it messy and, and quite a great challenge as well at the same time. <laughs> Well, mate, considering what you do, you, you're probably one of the best parts of the world to do it. You you are a pretty extreme dude, and you've done some pretty extreme stuff, mate. Where does your journey begin? Because I know you've you've done a whole bunch of stuff. Like I've got I've got I've got some stuff in front of me here, and I just want to highlight a few things. You started playing professional rugby at the age of eighteen. Uh, you retired from uh, rugby in two thousand and ten. But um, you've done the marathon to sell us to 251 self-supported, uh, 251K self-supported ultra marathon across the Sahara Desert over six days. You also did the 230K uh, self-supported race in Kenya and you completed a triple ascent of the Tour de France hardest climb. And then in 2018, you set the world record for the ultra cycling, uh, ultra cycling where you were actually hit by a truck and smashed into a brick wall. And since then, you've completed over 30 other marathons in 30 days, just nine months after your accident. And then in 2019, you ran 206.9 Ks around a 400-meter track in 24 hours, didn't get dizzy or fall out, and then also completed a 50-kilometer cycle, 50-kilometer run, 50-kilometer al Quadra in Dubai, and a 42-kilometer race trail race on the Volvic Volcano. What the fuck is wrong with you, brother? <laughs> I thought I was a hardcore motherfucker. And I read this, I'm like, oh my God, this is like, I need to get, I need to step it up. <laughs> mate, what the bloody hell? Yeah, it's been. Uh... You're a bit of a weapon, mate. So where, where does your journey begin? Like, where does it, like, if someone says, like, where, what's your story? Like, where do you start? I, I, I guess, mate, it really, it, it all goes back to my parents. When I was younger, we actually moved to Dubai when I was four years old. And when I was younger, I just remember my, my mum and dad out running all the so time. So you've been living in Dubai for, since you were four? Yeah, yeah, 38 years. Wow, you're basically a Dubai native. So you yeah. moved to Dubai when you were four. Keep going. I won't interrupt, or I yeah. will, but keep going yeah. anyway. So I, I remember I have these real clear memories when I was younger of mum and dad sort of always going out running and stuff and dad riding his bike and they were always like racing and like I've got pictures of me and mum at races and stuff and she'd, she'd be winning medals and I was like, this is amazing. And, and as far as early as I can remember, they would run from our house on like a Thursday evening and I'd, I'd time my run sort of while they were coming back. So I'd be allowed to run up the street for like 200 meters. And then I'd obviously just try and gas them at the end. And 
I mate, and this is what it is. It's all about the environment. They they brought me up in this environment, mate. That sport, waking up at four thirty, five a.m. to do sport. Mum winning races, dad doing triathlons was all. It was just so normal, mate. And then I went on to I went to boarding school in the UK because I wasn't very well behaved here, as probably we all not at that age. And I learned. So they thought they'd send you to boarding school versus you getting arrested. Is that how it was going to go? Yeah. <laughs> Because playing up in Dubai is not the same as playing up in the UK when you're like 15 years of age, from what I understand. It's a little bit different, bud. But when I was at school, I, I realized quite quickly that if I was good at sport, I would get certain privileges. I was able to yeah, right. eat more food. I was able to sit with teachers that I liked. I was able to stay up later. I was actually, one of the privileges that I got at boarding school because I was quite good at running was I was allowed to wake up at 5 a.m and go out running on my own in the middle of winter. So it was snowy, dark, and I used to really love it, mate. And I, I because I, I, I just felt that I was, without sounding like a prick, I felt like I was better than the other kids. Like I was I was up earlier and I was, I was just winning at life. And so that's really when it all started, mate. And, and it just, it fuels, like one thing fuels another. So I, I, I was quite successful running at school. So I wanted to run faster and then I wanted to run longer. And then I was good at rugby and I wanted to play better. And I, I always, I was just... I was going to say, with, a, with an obsession with running, especially the endurance, you would have been very popular uh, with the rugby coach. Yeah, yeah, mate. And that's like preseason was was my jam. Like it, it, they all used to laugh at me because I was this you know, a little blonde kid from Dubai and pre-season I'd come back with suntans and all of this stuff. But then, mate, by the time it got to November, December, I didn't want to touch the rugby ball because it was flipping freezing cold. <laughs> and it's like, but I'd, I'd look really good at the start of the season, you know. So, yeah, it was just it that sport to me was everything, mate. I wasn't very good in the classroom and I, I didn't. I wasn't focused, mate. I, I just I, I couldn't see the point of being in school like when I could be out playing sport. Were you a little bit ADHD? Um, honestly, mate, if 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 that was, and I know it was a a, a, a case then, but it wasn't yeah. common, was it? Like you weren't diagnosed with ADHD when when I like I'm 42. So, but I think. If I if it was if it was like it was today, I would definitely be ADHD. My my mom's was like, Marcus, you're dyslexic. I'm like, Mom, I'm not dyslexic. I just don't want to learn how to spell. Like, you know what I mean? It was it yeah. was weird. So definitely, they, they, mate, I I would have been a good candidate for ADHD back then. I think you know, without making light of the situation of what it is, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so, at what point did you realize that you could make a professional career out of this? You at 19, you you became a professional rugby player. Yeah, but is that where you saw yourself going? Not, not really, mate. I, I just knew that I wanted to do sport, and I said to my dad when I was eighteen, I was like, I don't want to go to university, and he goes, mate, just go, study a sports course, and I went, mate. And funny story, I went out on a night out after a rugby game on a Saturday night, and I, I, I woke up the next morning. I didn't really know where I was. And I'm not really proud of this, mate, but it's kind of like what it was back then. And I'd obviously had too many beers and I woke up and I was not in my own home. And I knew that morning at 10 o'clock I had to be at a, a trial game. And I, yeah, I went home and I got, got my kit, probably stinking, got my kit and got to the trial game. And mate... I don't know. I can't really remember how I played, but I remember a few weeks later, this letter in the days of letters, you know, this was like 96, this letter came through my letterbox and it was on a, on a yellow piece of paper. And it was an invitation for a meeting with a rugby club. And that was actually my first paid contract. And I was like, off the back of a hangover game. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, we hate you, pal." <laughs> <laughs> he he gets selected. What was it that about your game that made you play at that level? I just had a stinging <laughs> headache. <laughs> I just want to get off the field and have a drink. Oh, yeah, <sighs> honestly, Cohen, I'm I'm not proud of that at all. But it's just it's it it sort of highlights there's a lot of special moments that happen in life, and mm. I believe that everything happens for a reason. And I went out that night, ended up where I ended up, and I just had. 
a great game. And that was my first contract. And it was for, it was great, mate, because I was a student and they paid my petrol and they paid me like, I think I got like 30 pounds, which is probably, probably about $50 a game. Well, when you're a student in 1996, that's like, that was my groceries for the week, you know? Mm. Um, and, and that's really, that's where it started. But I, I continued, and this is, this is quite important, I continued having this affiliation or this, this love for running, if you like, and always said to myself, I, I don't want to be a fat rugby player, you know, and, and, or, or one of those big blokes with a big beer belly. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to continue to be good at running. And my, my goal is I should always be able to run 10K in about 45 minutes, and I should always just be able to go and run 20K. And I kept that in my mind all the way through through when I was playing rugby, mate. And that's why sort of when I finished playing in 2010, the first thing I did was register for a marathon, like literally two weeks after. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, so what was the length of your professional rugby career from 19 to 2010? What, what's that in terms of your yeah. – your... So I, I, I basically played full-time only for about three years, mate. And, right. I, I, and and then I was sort of – I was part-time when I was working at Adidas, but I was playing for the national team over here, and I had some great opportunities to travel around the world, play in the World 7 Series. So I played in about eight or nine different countries on, on the World 7 Series with all the big teams, the All Blacks, New Zealand, Australia, England. Actually, when I was living in Australia – and, mate, I, this might sound bad for you as, as well because – when I was living in Australia, they, they actually offered me an Australian passport to play for Australia Sevens, but because I'm English, I just, mate, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I, I let go of this opportunity. Mate, it's okay. <laughs> Not everyone is ready to be that great in every <laughs> lifetime. So maybe next lifetime, Neo. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's Australia. She goes, mate, you know, maybe you're not ready for it. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. So. So yeah, that's- mate. Once upon a time, you had to commit a crime in order to get an Australian passport. You were offered one without even committing a crime. So, mate, you clearly got something special going on. It was incredible, mate. I, I do want to dig into a little bit of your psychology for a moment because clearly you grew up in the in the perfect environment for you to learn, you know, how to endure. Uh, pain and suffering and develop a level of resilience that enables you to do the things that you've done, but also to do what you do because you're 42 years of age and you're still running marathons. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And and not not just you know not on a sporadic basis. You do this as a as a, as a pr- pretty much at a, at a and I'm going to say at a professional level because you train other people how to run marathons as well. Yes, you run camps. Good. Yeah. And so what I'm curious is what did you learn about yourself when you were younger that you still hold with yourself today when it comes to that mental game? Because you know it's one thing to be able to run to the shops, but it's another thing to be able to run to the shops when they're 32 kilometers away. Uh, and be able to do it in a pace that, you know, enables you to get there before they close. For me, I've always been someone that's been curious about what's going on inside of the head of the individual that has to push to extraordinary levels in order to achieve the outcome that they're looking for. And so for me, at what point did you start becoming conscious of the mental game and the conversations that were going on in your your head? And what did they sound like? And have they evolved, you know, in the last, you know, 30, 40 years? To be honest with you, my whole life's been experimenting with that. Now, I think it started when I was about seven or eight years old. And again, through my father, I wouldn't, I'd see him in pain, but like when he was doing physical things, but never really, you know, just enduring it. And I think that's one of the biggest things that happens when we come into these challenging situations, we start to fight. We start to to fight ourselves, mate. And it's this. It's almost this concept of like you've got to let things flow in and flow out. In, in meditation, I guess it, it's like equanimity. You've got to just let it come. Things are coming to you for a reason, and they'll go as well. So you can get the voice in your head is your voice. It's your subconscious talking to yourself, and if you start to fight it, then it gets upset. It's like the chimp paradox, if you like. And we and we just we, we're having this big war. Whereas if you embrace it, like you chose to be there. I chose to be in those situations. And even the situations when I had my crash that I didn't choose to be in, I'd built up this skill set that would be like, okay, I'm in this situation. What do I do? And this is, it's what I call really the, the ultra mindset where, you know, a lot of people will try and tell themselves, this is not happening to me. Like that's the worst thing. It's happening. 
Like when I was nine years old, I was running cross country. I was in extreme pain. It's happening. So the first step is to admit that there's, it's happening. And in that admittal, the next thing you do is you immediately reject that it's going to stop you from achieving your goal. Because a lot of the time we're looking for excuses to stop the pain because we want it to stop. But I don't believe in that, mate. I believe if we're going to do something like our objective today is to finish this podcast. If I got halfway through and you asked me a question that's a little bit uncomfortable, like, I'd just like, why would I stop talking to you? Like, we just have to reject the fact that it's going to get there. And, and mate, and there's two other real key important parts of of the ultra mindset for me which is one is just staying relaxed and then just asking yourself this question and mate this one really came to the, and that's why i say it's been a lifetime because this one came to the front when i was in intensive care after i got hit by a truck i just asked myself every moment of every day what can i do right now to get just a little bit better and mm. i think we we're, we're we're always looking for the big wins mate and some days you don't win big, but the small wins, and I know this might sound a bit wanky and cliched, but those small victories, mate, are the biggest wins. When I was in intensive care, I don't know, like, you can see this on the video, but my hand was like this. My whole left side was broken. My, col- uh, my shoulder was broken. My ribs were broken. And all I could do, mate, was turn this hand from here super slowly to palm up. So palm down for those that have not seen a video palm down to palm up and I literally could do that 10 times mate and I was absolutely smoked it was like around a marathon and but for me mate that was the biggest thing I could do at that point and I looked at it as though it was my it was if you want it was my Everest and these small tricks are so so important in in everything we do. I could have sat there in the hospital. I could have sat when I was younger saying, oh, there's a voice in my head. There's a voice in my head. It's you. It's your thoughts. It's just the meaning that you give to those thoughts and then the stories that you're trying to tell yourself. And, you know, we, we, we were doing, you like this one, mate. We were doing a challenge the other week and it, it was mayhem. And one of my friends asked me afterwards, he's like, do you think we reached the limit today? Like we were cycling at 11.30, we'd, we'd cycled 50K, we'd just run 50K, and then we started cycling again to cycle another 50K. That was a challenge, 50, 50, 50. And it was, we'd been on the bike about half an hour, it was 52 degrees, it was just like a hot hairdryer. And I cracked massively. I was just, my, I, I never felt anything like it before. And my friend sent me a message and he said, do you think you reached your limit today? I said, I don't think so. I said, where we got, I don't, I don't believe in a limit. I said, we reached a state today that we've never been in before. So we didn't know how to behave. So in that moment, we had to learn to behave in a way that got us through that. So there are not limits. There are just situations that we haven't learned behaviors yet. So if you stay, mm. if you stay open-minded and you're ready to learn new behaviors, on the fly, in pain, in trouble, with blood dripping out of various parts of your body, in extreme physical pain or, 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 or emotional pain, then you're going to grow. But if you're not ready to learn a new behavior, then, then you're, you're sunk already. So that's kind of how I see it. <laughs> Mate, now you were hit by a car. When, what year were you hit by the truck, I should say, not a car? You were hit by a truck. 2018. Yeah. So that was only two years ago. Yeah. And at this point in your life, you've, you've done a shitload, of very, a shitload of very hard things. But more, I guess I'm curious, run me through that day. You get up out of bed. What happens? Run me through. What happens? So I, went, I woke up, mate. We went to – I always kiss my wife goodbye. I tell her I love her every single day, mate. I, I, we've been together 17 years, and she's one of the most incredible people. And she always – when I'm going cycling, she just said, be safe. Yeah, 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 I'll be safe. Get on the bike, three other mates, a route we've ridden. By the way, is, is this in Dubai? Yeah. I've seen videos of how they drive in Dubai. So <laughs> <laughs> keep going. <laughs> I'm always safe in Dubai. I don't know. I don't know, Marcus. I've seen the videos. The way those guys drive, it's pretty incredible. So four of us are out riding. We've ridden this route a number of times, mate. We come down a hill. I see this truck. It's made an illegal U-turn. And 
This is a little bit about ownership, mate. My accident was 50% my mistake and 50% the driver's mistake. We're going down a hill very fast. The truck slowed down. I chose to take the guys and to go on the hard shoulder where I thought we'd be safe and essentially undertake this truck who at the last minute turned in to come off the road and crossed us. I hit the front wing of his car and then was pushed onto a wall, which I hit dead at 54 kilometers an hour. Um, one of the things in cycling is obviously being on the front. And because I was quite heavy, we were coming down a, a slight hill. I was on the front and the three guys were behind me. And fortunately, those three guys had a split second and they moved left around the truck and they got away with no injuries. Also, fortunately, two of those guys were airline pilots. So their ability to react to a kind of a pretty serious situation was incredible. And the third guy was a professional cyclist who had seen a lot of accidents before. Mm. Uh, I was laid on the floor, mate, to, to sort of give you a quick spiel on it. I was laid on the floor and it was weird because and you might say it's natural reflexes. You might say it's because of my rugby days. But in that split second when I hit the truck and hit the wall, I dropped my shoulder, my left shoulder. So I took all of the impact and that on impact shattered my scapula. And I broke seven of my ribs on impact, which to be honest, mate, broken bones are, are, are not for the most part a problem. They're not life-threatening. But what was a problem was the impact and the, the break in my ribs crush my left lung almost like a beach ball that just went and it goes down and so you collapsed your lung so i collapsed my lung a lung hemothorax and i didn't i couldn't figure it out i was just like oh i'm really winded and you know it's all these funny things that are like natural reactions i'm like oh do my fingers work yeah they're good and i wriggled my toes like they got the bike off me and i just knew i was in a lot of pain and i'd broken a lot but then i was like oh i can't breathe and then in, in, with that thought, blood started coming out of my mouth. And I'm like, fuck. Oh, shit. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it's, it's not like a, a movie. That's one thing. Yeah. 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 One thing you don't want when you, got, when you can't breathe. There's blood coming out your mouth, especially if it's got bubbles in it. Yeah. It, exactly. And, and we, were, we were actually in the mountains between sort of Dubai and, and another city. And we're 80. We're in the middle, mate. It was like it was the perfect place not to crash. 80K from one city, 80K from another city. It was like, it was, it was crazy where we were. And I, what happened next, mate, is, is I want to try and explain it in the best way I can because I think it will give people a lot of value. I saw the truck driver coming towards me and, and as I saw him come, I saw almost just the outline. And as I saw the outline of him, I looked through him and I saw the other side of the road and there's like this curb on the road. And every time I tell this story, mate, and the first few times it was hard, it's hard now, but it gets easier. I saw this curb and in seeing this curb, all of my pain completely, and, and mate, the more I think of it, it's, it's, it's insane. It disappeared. I was pain free. I could breathe. And I thought to myself, I'm not really here anymore. And the more I've thought of this, Kerwin, I don't know, and I'm, I, mate, I don't want to freak people out, but I almost, it was almost like my body and my soul was starting to detach. Yeah, wow. And I thought, I'm having such a great life. I have a wife who I love. I have parents who have taught me everything. I have a community that I love, people that I can serve every single day that allow me to coach them, to make them better. And really, I, I don't want that to end. And I thought, well, what, what's, what's the options then? And it's weird, mate. It's like this calm. I, there was no noise around me. There was nothing. Although there was noise because everyone's going, fuck, he's dying and this and that. And in that, mate, I thought to myself, well, there's only two options here. Either you just stay where you are and it's all over. Or, and I said it to myself, and, and this is the, that's why my documentary is called Fight for Every Breath. 
I said, the second option is fight for every breath. And in that, mate, and the more I think about that, that was mm. the, the only option. The only option was to fight. And once I made that decision, the, the, the pain, the winded, the, the inability to breathe, the noises, the smells, everything came back. I was back in my body. And, and it I, hurt like fucking hell. And it hurt like fucking hell, mate. And that was the war. And literally, bro, it took me two hours to get to the hospital. No painkillers, nothing. Two different ambulances. It's, it's a whole long story. And got there and literally I was just like, I, 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 have, I don't think, mate, I've understood that part yet. Like the next part. Bits of it come back to me. I was fully conscious, so it's not like I was, I was unconscious. But the more I talk about it, therapy through it is, is, is amazing. Like every time I share this story, it helps me. So thank you for listening because that's helped me a little bit more. But those two hours, mate, were, were just brutal and until, I, until I got some, some painkillers. But it just showed me, and I think about this a lot and I reflect on this a lot, that in life we have way too many choices. And we're spoiled with choices. If you narrow things down and you put every ounce of energy into that thing you want to achieve, you can achieve it. And in, on that day, on the 10th of February, 2018, my energy was into living. And it's amazing, mate. And I'm so glad that accident happened. I wouldn't change anything. And for those of you that think I'm full of shit, go and check my Instagram on the 9th of February, I posted a quote. It's still there. It says, everything happens for a reason. No, oh, fucking hell, son. Bloody hell. <laughs> I don't know, wow. man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And so let's explore that for a moment because it sounds like to me you've introduced, you know, most people take them a little bit of time before hindsight kicks in and they go, you know what? At the time, I thought it was the worst thing that could have possibly happened. You know, now two years later, I reflect on it and I start to see the benefits. At, at what point did you start to integrate a hindsight mentality, like a, 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 a balance in the perspective of, so you will, of, you know, this being potentially one of the most devastating things? Because you're a performer, you're an, you're an ultra athlete coach, you're an ultra athlete. You know, you make your living by being able to run, swim, get on bikes and, you know, coach people to do the same. So for many people, you know, you could have been lying there going, fuck, it's all over. You know, at what point... Did you have that? And at what point did it did the perspective start to balance out where that post on the 9th of February started to really drive home and you started to understand why it happened? Mate, it was it was actually when I was in intensive care. So when I was in How long were you in intensive care? I was in intensive care for three days. Now the first day I was in intensive care, literally my wife got there within I mean, mate, imagine this. It it it's it's horrific. And I don't want to make it soppy about my wife all the time, but I, I have to. No, you have to put it. perspective, mate. Like, yeah. my friends, I, I have on my wrist my, my emergency contact numbers, and my friends took my wife's number from my wrist and they called her on the side of the road. And they said, one of the other guy's wives is on, Mike's is at a crash. He, uh, she's on her way to pick you up, uh, pack a bag. And I'm like, I think about this now. I'm like, oh my God. Like, and, and Holly says it, mate. She's like, it wasn't until I put the phone down when I thought, well, if Marcus was okay, why didn't he call me? And she gets to intensive care, mate. She pulls back the curtain. I'm in a mess. By this time, I've got a, I've got a tube coming into my ribs to drain the blood off. I've got a catheter in. I can't move. And, you know, I'm drugged up, so it just looks awful. And she's just, she's just amazing, mate. My mom came in. She broke down. And <laughs> sorry, mate. No, nah, mate, feel it. I'm with you, brother. <laughs> feel the feels, mate. Breathe. <sighs> and Holly came in, mate, and she was. She was incredible. She, her face, she just smiled for me and it lifted me up. And I, I was there, mate, and she was laid on my bed 
or by the side of my bed. She was sat, sorry, I was always laid on the bed. And I remember just being like, I was in pain, so I was in and out of sleep. And um, I woke up one time and I was, I'd obviously had like a dream or something about it. And I, I was losing it, mate. I was, I was trying to, like, I was obviously pathetic. And I was like, why did this happen to me? And, and you know, I was probably at like no volume at all. And I was, I, she said, what are you talking about? I was like, why did it happen? What if it was different? And, and mate, something that's crazy is every time we'd cycle this route, we'd stop at this service station and we'd have a cup of coffee. And on this day, I asked the guys, it's my round, guys. Who wants a coffee? And everyone goes, no, no, we don't want one. And I'm like, okay. And we carried on. But, mate, if we'd have had a coffee. Ooh, sliding doors. <laughs> so it's like anyone says to me <laughs> from now on. You anyone- want a coffee? You fucking oath I do. <laughs> Every fucking I'll take two. Double shot, son. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Holly just looked at me, mate. And with these stern eyes. And I remember she said to me, she said, Marcus, what happened, happened. And you know what? I thought of, I didn't say anything, mate. And I thought about it and I went back to sleep. And I woke up maybe 10 or 15 minutes later and I looked at her and I said to her, you're right. I said, and I, I started grinning, mate. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? And she's like, what? I said, I'm going to start training. And she looked at me. She's like, what? <laughs> that, that, He's got concussion. Get the doctor. <laughs> is when I started my what can I do now? And mm. I started lifting my hand from palm down to palm up. And she just, she looked at me. She was smiling. And I told her, I'm going to do this 10 times. And when I was smoked, I said, I'm going to rest now for 10 minutes. And then I'm going to do it again, mate. And to answer your question, that's when this whole recovery started, mate. Because what happens, and that there was then another point in the, in the main hospital ward where one of my friends came in and he said, listen, make sure you talk about it. And I've thought about that a lot, mate. But identifying, and it goes back to what I was saying pretty much close to the start with my ultra mindset approach is you have to admit there's a problem and you have to let it come out. And I was so fortunate, mate. I had hundreds of people coming to see me in hospital. And they're like, I bet you're bored of talking about the story. I was like, no, I want to tell you it. I want to say it. I want to hear it again. I want to know that it's happened. I want it to come out. I want all of this shit to come out. I want to relive it. I want to feel it. I want you to feel it. I need to get it out. I need to know. I can't keep it in. And, mate, two years later, I have not had one single flashback. I have not had one nightmare, nothing. I've woken up every single day ready to live my life. And so, folks, if you're struggling, if there's stuff that's happened that you haven't spoken about, you don't have to tell the whole of the hospital ward. Find someone. Grab them really flipping tight as I had to do that day with Holly and just let it all come out, mate. And you know that. I know you know that, Kerwin. I know you've had people on your show that have, have, have spoken about it. I've listened to, to, to the great people, but we can't, I can't emphasize it enough. It's, it's what's helped me. And I mean, you guys just heard me before. I, I lost it. Like, I still lose it from time to time, you know, but you've got to let it come out. But it does lead me to another question because, you know, you, you, you started your recovery as soon as Holly came in and, and she said, it is, it, what happened, happened. You know, it reminds me of a, a, a quote from uh, Morpheus and uh, and even Peter Crone. You know, what happened happened. It couldn't have happened any other way. Otherwise, it wouldn't have. You know, yeah. or something to that effect. I know I fucked that up some way, shape, or form. But um, what I'm interested in is okay. You started with you know, hand up, hand down, palm up, palm down. But I'm going to assume there was a lot of moments in your recovery. You know, especially with broken ribs, especially with broken shoulder where you were going to, you were enduring incredible levels of pain. Um, but I guess in contrast, how did it compare to some of the ultra stuff that you'd already done? Like, was it on a, was it a similar sort of pain where you're like, okay, I've experienced this kind of pain before I know what to do. Or was this like, okay, this is a new type of pain. I haven't actually experienced this type of pain before. This is different. Yeah. It, it, it was a mixture of both mate. And I, I have quite a, a clear opinion on pain. 
it's different for every single one of us. We can't ever compare how much pain we've been in. And no matter how much I tell you it was painful, you can't understand it because we can't share. There's no metric on pain. However, because of the situations that I'd been in, I had a protocol of how to deal with it. I had a procedure. And it was, it, it goes back similar to what I was saying, mate, is you can't say that the pain is going away. I wanted the pain to be there because I wanted to feel it get better. So when I checked out of hospital after a week, they gave me literally a shopping bag full of painkillers and I threw them away a day later because I didn't want them. I wanted to feel my body, mate. I wanted to, I didn't want to be an idiot and I didn't want to be so big and arrogant that I, that I, you know, uh, I'm in pain and I'm ignoring it. No, I wanted to feel it, mate. And I wanted to know that I was getting better every single day and my body was healing. So I spent a week at home healing. And then I said to Holly, I said, I can't stay at home. And this is something else that I think is just one of the, one of the most important things for people is I had to change my environment. Our home life is great, but I knew I needed energy. And I, I own a gym here in Dubai. And I said to Holly, I said, I'm going to the gym. And she's like, if you work out, you're an idiot. And I said, no, I'm not going to work out. And every day for a week, mate, I went to the gym. I limped there, shoulder like this. And I pulled up a stool and I just sat and I watched people working out. And the energy that I got and the power of seeing people and being in the environment in my gym that I worked so hard to create such a positive energy and such a great environment for high performance it started my healing because generally mate, we sit at home or we sit in hospitals and we look at four walls and we move from the couch and we just, we're not in the right environment. And I needed that hit. I sat there for two or three hours every day, just watching people and just feeding off a massive on energy, as you can probably tell mate, just feeding off their energy and just healing by being there. And I knew if I did that, I'd feel good enough within a week to start training. So the following weekend, I said to her, it was like Saturday, Sunday or whatever. I said, I'm starting training tomorrow. She's like, how are you going to get there? So I'm going by Uber. And I started training, mate. And I walked into the gym at a few minutes before 5 a.m. on the first day of the week. It was a Sunday here because we have a funny weekend. And I looked around the gym and I was like, what can I do? And I didn't look at anything that I can't do and wish that I could run, jump, fly, whatever. And I grabbed a little step that was about two inches high. And I said, I wonder if I can step up and down on that. And I started. And then I just started moving my hands. And for those of you that know the Tabata training system, 20 seconds work, 10 seconds rest, I did Tabata on like three or four movements that I could do for an hour, nonstop. Mate, I was dripping wet through, endorphins, feeling amazing. And I'd literally, I'd I'd done a a workout that a 200-year-old could have done. But for me that day, again, that was my Everest, mate. It was amazing. And I felt so good. And I got a little bit closer to my recovery. You know, I just moved a little bit more along along that scale. And I knew... I was miles away. I knew it would, this was going to take months, but I'd taken ownership from it and I'd made that small step on that day. And a lot of people as well, and it's probably going to be your next question, did you get physio? Mate, I went to one physio session because physios, wow. don't, physios don't fix you, mate. You fix you. You have to go and do the work. And it's not rocket science. Like people say to me, oh, it really hurts when I run. Well, Stop running, you moron. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? It's like my hamstring sore and it hurts when I run at like four minutes a K. Well, what the fuck are you doing it for then? Stop. Like the body is telling you something. Do you know what I mean, mate? And it's and that's what I did. I was like, oh, my shoulder feels good in this position. I can put it in this position. And I just continued to do that every single day, mate. And and I think that's what 
like a lot of people will turn around and say to me, they say, oh, you recovered really fast because four months later I ran a marathon in, in, in Volvec across the volcanoes in France. They're like, oh, you recovered so fast. I was like, I just say to them, I honestly just say, yeah, mate, I did. And then I think to myself, you fucking moron. I well, fucking let's look at that because you recovered really fast, but you've been training 38 years to recover very fast. Correct. Thank you, sir. Right, thank- yeah. You. And, you know, that kind of a recovery doesn't happen in four months. That com- that happens with 38 years of preparation in order for it to be nailed in four months. And so that's where I think there could be some people going, well, fuck, you know, oh, geez, I, you know, if, if I was, you know, if I'd been through that many marathons and that many ultras and I was that well conditioned, I'd probably re- rebound that, that quickly as well. But it kind of leads me to the point of, you know, asking the question, can resilience be taught? Because we know resilience and grit go hand in hand with people being able to push through the pain barrier, being able to, you know, sustain progress in an environment that in most cases is inducing suffering. We know from the Navy SEALs, you know, of 80% of people who fall out, you know, in, in the first six weeks of BUDS, most people fall out in that last week of hell week. What they've done with all the psychological profiling, all the assessments is they've identified that those 20% that are unable to sustain through that suffering have developed over a period of time what they call grit. And grit is resilience and that resilience is that ability to suffer for an extended period of time in order to attain an objective. But it leads me to the question that, you know, this is what you do, this is what you've been doing, but how would you teach it? Let's say you were going to be working with someone who is a 30-year-old or a 35-year-old who didn't have the upbringing that you had, who never was exposed maybe to the level of sport or resilience and always told us, oh, if it hurts, stop, that means something's wrong. And yeah. then they're like, get to the age of 30, and like, well, fuck, I feel like I've been robbed. You know, Every time I try and do something that's uncomfortable, I stop. And I, wa- I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to push through. I want to know how to go through things. If you were sitting down with a 35-year-old who wanted to learn how to develop resilience – not push a button to develop resilience. Go, right, here are the practices that yep. you need to, you know, acquire as habits and routines with a level of discipline. Yep. This is what you need to do in order to develop it. How would you teach someone to develop grit? Mate, I do it with a lot of people because I, I get 30-year-old people that just don't know how to push. So mm-hmm. and not that people think that to develop mental resilience, we have to be in a state of extreme physical suffering, which comes at 70 kilometers in a 200 kilometer race. No, you don't have to. Think about this, folks. If you're one of those people that Curran just spoke about, do one thing tomorrow morning. Wake up at 4.29. Don't wake up at 4.30. Every other prick in the universe sets his alarm for 4.30. You start your life and your day one minute earlier at 4.29 or 4.59. I never, ever set an alarm on the hour or on the half hour. It's always one minute earlier. If I want to wake up at 4.15, it's 4.14. One minute early every time. Trick number one. Second trick, go to your bathroom, put the shower on ice cold and get in that damn thing. Stand under it for as long as you can physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever, tolerate. Stand under that shower. It might be 15 seconds on the first day, especially if you live in the UK and it's absolutely freezing. It's not now, but I mean, they're having summer there, mate. I think it's 12 degrees. Still, the water's going to be really cold. Stand under it every single day. Then when you finish your shower, go out for a walk. Don't run. There is no point in starting to run on day one. If you hate running, can't run, you're too overweight to run, it's going to hurt your knees, hurt something, don't run. Walk. Get out of your house. Look at the street light that's just down the way. Walk to it. When you get to that one, walk to the next one. This sounds so basic, mate, but these are the key building blocks. They're the foundations. When you've walked for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, I don't give a rat's how long it is on day one. Come home. Write down what you've done, that you got out of bed straight away, that you did the shower for 10 seconds and that you did the walk for five minutes. Make a decision that tomorrow you want to be a slightly better human being. Tomorrow you stand in the shower for 11 seconds and you walk for six minutes and we build it every single day. So many people, mate, want to build mental resilience, mental toughness, grit, all of those things that you spoke about. So they go and sign up for a flipping Ironman triathlon. They've never run more than 5K. Never mind ridden a bike 180 and they're scared shitless of the ocean. 
And then they're absolutely astonished, can't understand why they failed after three weeks. It's that simple, mate. You have to build those small things. And as you get better at that, you start to develop. And then we can put you in a 10K race. And that 10K race becomes a 21K race. And that 21K race becomes an ultra. And that day ultra becomes a night ultra where I get you into the second night and you're hallucinating. And then we really start in the party because life <laughs> is pretty <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> now we're talking. I didn't know I could hallucinate by going on ultras. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. That hey, sounds like my kind of ultra. That's the way, mate. That's the way it goes. Sleep deprivation leads to hallucination. And we have a lot of races that could be the first race I did, mate, I was awake for 60 hours. And it was absolutely incredible. Not, not, I'm not promoting it in, a, in, 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 like it was massive enjoyment. It was, it was pretty brutal, mate. But the experience that I got from it and what I learned from it is amazing. But everyone hears about that. And that's the, and this is the thing, mate. And I think you've seen it. You've spoken to so many people. I've heard it on the show. Like that stuff, the Iron Man finish line, if you want, is the sexy stuff. That's what people want. That's the emotion that people want to buy. But what I want to help people do is actually get there. And that starts way before. It starts with the discipline of waking up in the morning. There's a book, what is it called? Make Your Bed. You know, first thing, make your bed by the American... The, the Navy like, SEAL, the chief... Uh, you know it. Chief yeah. Navy, chief chief SEAL. That, that's <laughs> I'll get fucking assassinated for saying that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> But these are the things, mate, that we take for granted. Like how much – like the snooze button is the biggest sort of failure button in the universe, mate. And when we take clients on, we ask them. We ask them casually in our intake questionnaire, do you press snooze in the morning? Because that tells us so much about their personality. If you're a snoozer and you're listening to this show right now, make it a goal. No freaking snooze button for the next 30 days and set your alarm one minute earlier and you're starting to build grit and mental resilience it is mate like you said something that you build and you build it over time and yes i think you're absolutely right i probably started building it when i was five years old and when i was nine i was taking international flights on my own as an unaccompanied minor and it probably all of these things built my mental resilience and my grit but that doesn't mean that at 42, I can't make it more, you know? I can- and that you can't show other 35 or even 42 or even 52-year-olds how to do it themselves. Absolutely. And that kind of leads me to a question. You know, this is what you do. You are in the part of the world where I, I'm going to only assume you don't only get high-level athletes coming to you. I'm going to assume that you get, you know, very wealthy, middle-aged um, individuals who are going, well, I've got enough money. Now I want to buy myself endurance i want to buy myself fitness and then they go well you're like well you can buy the best bike you can buy the best shoes but pal yeah i can't buy someone you can probably buy someone to put under the shower for you as well but what has been some of the most radical transformations that you've seen from a resilience standpoint and the reason i'm focusing on the resilience and not so much the fitness and the competition is because i'm of this belief that when you can transfer when someone can condition themselves to start developing resilience their whole life fucking changes because right. pain is in most cases the thing that people use as a signal to stop doing things. They get pain in a relationship. So, oh, that's uncomfortable. So I won't have that conversation. They get pain when they're having conversations with their kids. Oh, I won't have that conversation. They have pain when they feel the embarrassment of trying to you know, start a business, but it didn't go well the first time. And I'm of the honest belief that if we all were shown or conditioned as children how to develop high levels of resilience, then we'd all be a lot happier because we'd be pursuing things with a lot more vigor that would actually light us up or at least give us the indication of it's what we want or what we don't. So from your experience, what have been some of the most phenomenal transformations that you've seen with people who've come in expecting it to be easy? It wasn't, but they pushed through anyway and you're like, fucking hell, that's pretty impressive. I'll tell you a quick story. I I got one of the we've had two really big guys come in one of the guys was a was an arab guy who was 197 kilos oh shit yeah and literally mate he was sat in front of me and he's talking but you know what it's like when when someone's talking and you can hear the noise but you're just looking into them and you're just thinking what the fuck am i going to do with this like what am i going to do here like what am i going to do special with project this? yeah and I know, and I talk a lot about listening and we should listen to people, but I, I don't know what he was saying, 
But I was looking at him going, oh, my God, I, I, I've never seen anything like this before. Anyway, I started talking to him about his eating. And obviously, mate, you get 197 kilos from eating too much. And he would tell me, or he was telling me like, you know, Whoppers and Big Macs and this and that and the other. And I was like, hang on a minute, mate. Can you say that again? And he'd be like, yeah, I'd basically spend like three hours in Hungry Jacks. And mate, when he said that, and then I started to think, fuck. That's discipline. That's it. That's That's discipline. That mate. takes discipline. I can't stay. I couldn't fucking walk into a Hungry Jacks for someone to spend three hours in there. That takes a level of discipline. Imagine, that's something you can tap mate. into. And that's what I said to him. And I said to him, I said, you have everything I need to get you under 100 kilos. You have every single bit of grit, resilience, whatever you want to call it, to get under. And he's looking at me going, I am so fat. I don't. <laughs> huh? Brother. You have woken up every single morning for the last 10 years feeling like absolute shit and you've tolerated it. You've then got in your car, which has been difficult because you're so big and you've driven to a fast food joint. You've then sat there for three hours eating more, feeling like it's so hard to get that big, mate. It's so hard. I said, all I'm going to do is flick that switch. Flip it. I said, I'm going to turn this whole thing around and I'm going to make you addicted to coming into my gym. And he laughed at me. And I said, well, listen, mate, I'll be honest. I don't know what the fuck else to do with you. So if this doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) If if this doesn't work, we'll we'll stable your tummy. (laughs) Bring out the stable gun. And he said, how does it work then? I said, again, I started with alarm clocks and this, that, and the other. And, mate, I just used to keep him in the gym. He'd come in and start to give him a personal trainer. And I'd just literally put him on a rowing machine. After his personal training session, I'd just be like, mate, just sit there. Just sit there. He said, do you want me to row? I was like, no, don't row. Just sit there. You're going to build yourself up. You're going to get – it's going back to what I was saying before. You're going to get into this environment, mate. So what – What's the learning, mate? Why is that story important? To answer your question is, we have to look in our lives. We all have some great characteristics. Some of those characteristics lead us to very bad places. His was an addiction and a resilience to eating bad food. We just had to flip that round. If you're struggling Mm. in your life, guys, look at what you're really good at or what you're excelling in. No matter if it's a positive thing for your body, or a negative thing. If you're suffering with alcoholism, figure out the, what behaviors are around that. If you're struggling with relationships, figure out all of the behaviors, identify them, look them straight in the face and ask yourself, how, what is it that makes me this type of person and what are the characteristics? Can I flip things around to be more positive for my life and to live the life I want rather than the life that I'm not really too interested in? And then you start to build things, mate. We all have resilience, Cohen. We all have it. Some of us, as we were saying before, have spent more time building it in what you and I would generally know as a positive way Mm. and positive terms. But some people have so much resilience, mate. Like, Like, just folks, think about that example. He was 197 kilos, 26 years old. Like, that's taken some guts to get to where he got to. And we flipped him around. We got him down to 95, put him on the front cover of Men's Health. Incredible. Wow. Did half Ironmans. Yeah, life's good. That's phenomenal. It's yeah. interesting because I've had similar situations before. I've had parents come and go, my child is so lazy. All he does is, or she does is sit down, they play video games. And I say, well, how long do they play video games? Oh, at least eight hours every day. I'm like, your child is not lazy. Your <laughs> yeah. child is a machine. I could not play a video game for more than 15 minutes. To be able to have the discipline to play for video games for eight hours a day, there's an esports athlete sitting right there. We just need to learn how to appreciate that discipline. And it's yeah. funny because the same thing happened for me in business, mate. When I first got into business, because I'd been told my whole life, 
that I was lazy, very much an athlete, very active, but in the house, didn't clean up after myself at school, never did my homework. And so as a result, I was labeled lazy. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't until I got into business and I, I had this identity that I was lazy, that I was lazy, that I was lazy. And I wasn't doing the things that needed to be done. And then a mate of mine sat me down and I said, he goes, well, what's the problem? I was like, well, mate, I, I think it's just because I'm lazy. He goes, you're the most unlazy motherfucker I know. You're training in the gym twice a day. You're training six days a week. You know, you're disciplined here and there. You train, you, you, and it, it's like, all you need to do is apply that discipline in that area of your life to this area of your life. And it was like a switch. Yeah. And as soon as that switch flicked, mate, everything was turned upside down and everything transformed. Now, Marcus, have you written a book? Because if you haven't, you need to write a book. Mate, so it's actually quite interesting. I, I, I haven't, I don't have a published book. I've been working on and off on a book for, for, for a couple of years now called Winning Your Inner Fight, which is pretty much everything we've been speaking about. And I, I believe, like I said, mate, everything happens for a reason. There's a reason why I haven't finished it. And I can't figure out what that reason is. I think it's because I keep writing new chapters. <laughs> no, you've been waiting for the right title. And I've got the right title for you. What is it? <laughs> Feathers, Bricks and Trucks. <laughs> right, there we go. Feathers, yeah. bricks, and trucks. Because sometimes we get a tickle. Yeah. Okay. And if we don't listen to that tickle, we get a knock. And if yeah. we don't listen to that knock, sometimes a truck comes along and you know it's, gives us a, a fairly big whack. Yeah. 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 No, it's it, it's interesting, mate. I, I I haven't written a book yet. I write a lot of articles. I also record a podcast. I share it as much as I can through my social to try and help people. But I, I haven't put a book I, – I've written like 15 chapters of, of what I think will be a book, but then you keep going over it and I'm maybe just procrastinating. Maybe I need someone to kick me in the nuts and flick that switch, mate, and say like get it done, get it out there and, you know, but uh, no, not yet. Mate, it'd, be a shame, it'd be a shame for that book not to be out there considering uh, the life that you've lived and the lives that you've changed. But you do have a documentary out there, Fight for Every Breath, about the, your, re, your rehabilitation from the, uh, from the accident. Yeah. Where can people find that, mate? It's on it's on YouTube. Fight for every breath is, is, is what it's called. It's also on my website, mjdsmith.com. And you know, big shout out. One of my mates just said, Listen, mate, this is a great story. I want to turn it into a documentary for you. It's about an hour long. And it yeah, it's uh that was tough, mate. That was, you know, like redoing like or doing interviews afterwards and putting everything together and it, but again, mate, it's just therapy and like today's show and sorry folks for what happened in the middle there, but you know, some days no apologies I, necessary. Sorry. I, I I remember, mate, and you're quite like this. I was actually one day I was having a dump and I was visiting <laughs> one of my friends. Mate, I gotta tell the full story. And he's a doctor in the UK and I sent him my scans and he just wrote back, how are you still alive? And honestly, mate, my, like I'm festering in my shit and I'm just crying my eyes out. Like it just flicked a switch and I was just like, and I'm not a crier, mate. I went to boarding school. I never saw my dad cry. I'm not a crier at all. And in funny situations, you know, you, you just kind of lose it. So hopefully it, it well, works. Well, I hope we're redefining, you know, what it's like to express emotion, especially as men, because yeah. I think oftentimes men are, are are conditioned and told that it's it's not uh, it's not socially acceptable. It's not something that men should do. And you know, I'm I'm very much of yeah. I think it's something that we should be demonstrating, yeah. which to me is how do we process and regulate emotion, yeah. and how do we release that emotion in a healthy way in a way that serves others? Because I can guarantee you there's going to be, you know, uh, quite a few men that will be listening to this that will be crying and many women who will listen to this and also be emotionally moved. Uh, and that hopefully will be, you know, in front of their children so that their children can see, oh, my God, dad does express emotion. Oh, my God, mum does express emotion. And that is an incredible gift that I think that we can give to the next generation, mate. So if people want to find out more about you, you fucking legend of a fucking man, where can they find out more about you? The best thing to catch me on is over on Instagram. I'm, I pretty much reply to everything I can, MJD underscore Smith. And I put all my ramblings and all my adventures and stuff up there. And with a simple goal, mate, is to try and inspire and, and help people get better. And I don't think that my accident was a turning point in my life, but I definitely know that it's fired me up quite a lot because of what I've learned from it and mate that experience that I shared with you like I did get a second chance you've also had a lot of second chances if you like mate or was it a second chance or is it just the way that it's supposed to be you know I think it's the way it's supposed to be sometimes 
I call it feathers, bricks, and trucks. <laughs> the people say, why do you think you've had so many near-death accidents? I'm, I'm just a fucking slow learner. I yeah. really am. There's nothing else to it. Mate, yeah. you've also got a um, uh, a paleo. It's a Smith Street Paleo. Yeah. Um, you've got your gym, the inner fight. Yeah. Uh, Smith Street Paleo. Tell us a little bit about that. So, mate, in 2006, my wife was a cabin crew. She's from Australia, and she was having a lot of problems with inflammation when she was flying. I was working out CrossFit. Paleo was something that was together, and we just started – we just went to sort of paleo-based diet, mate, paleo way of eating, nice and straightforward. It cured her inflammation. Literally, mate, I couldn't touch her. She, she used to ask, ask me to massage her ankles, and they were sort of touch. And it, was just, it just worked really well for us, mate, and we just wanted to share it with people. We're, it's a small food business. We, we deliver food here in Dubai. We started out in 2016 when she finished flying, and it's not for everyone, mate, but I think if we look back to, and this is one of the things like processed food, we know about it. Look at the way humans are today. Just look back a few years to how our ancestors lived, less disease, less autoimmune issues, less inflammation. And that's kind of what paleo is. It'll still be here in a number of years. We, you know, it's not, it's not like a, a trend diet or anything like that. I think it's, it's pretty legit. Same as, same as a lot of plant-based stuff, mate. And I think in all of these things, you got to figure out what works for you. And when I saw it cure exactly. my wife, I was like, there's something in this and it works for us. And Holly's 44 and she's about 12% body fat. And, you know, that's important because I think we should all wow. look, look good naked. And you know, I'm 42 and I'm about 7% body fat. And I'm, I, I have insane energy, mate, every single day. So it works for us. If you guys like it, eat paleo. If not, eat something else that works for you. I'm totally down with that. <laughs> Mate, you've, your, your story is incredible. We'll put those links in there. But um, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Marcus Smith, and this has been unstoppable. Well done, legend. Thank you, mate. Sorry. This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you get to see all of these interviews in the flesh share this podcast with your friends and drop me a review on itunes i would love to hear what you guys think and also let you know your comments help make sure that we keep producing killer content just like this and if you'd like to stay up to date with all of my movements upcoming podcasts events and much more please jump onto the website kerwinray.com and also check us out on all social media on the handle at kerwinray thanks for joining us